In this episode of XTV Newsers, we are talking to a gentleman who went from answering the phones at TV stations to being vice president of a marketing agency. So stay tuned. I'm XTV producer Jennifer Moore, and my next guest is Brian Jagger. He's an ex coworker and friend. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is cool. And Brian's coming from the, the windy city of Chicago in his, his like super hip loft there. He's got some uh, artwork going on. It's windy and rainy right now outside, so not very pleasant. Uh, but it's not snow, so I think we're hey, all happy about Yeah, we'll, that. we'll take that. Well, Brian and I worked together at Bay News 9 in Florida, and I didn't realize how long you'd actually been out of the business. Like, it felt like it was just like yesterday you were still doing it, but it's, it's been <laughs> a while. So can you kind of walk me through your own TV news journey? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we worked together, obviously, in Tampa before that. Um, I had worked at the TV station in Gainesville. Uh, I, like most TV news people, did the high school TV news program and uh, kind of fell in love with the whole medium at that point. But when I went off to college, it was kind of, I was an English major uh, for a while. And it was kind of getting to the point where I was going to my junior year, had no idea what I wanted to do. And my parents basically said that unless I got a quote unquote real major, then uh, they uh, were going to help uh, me pay for the rent and all that good stuff that you need to exist in that environment. So I uh, ended up going into telecommunications and did radio and TV in, in college and really just kind of fell in love with it. I was actually more radio than I was TV. So um, ended up uh, getting a call from a friend who was working at WCJB in, uh, in Gainesville, Florida, where a lot of people have kind of uh, earned their stripes. Uh, started as a weekend assignment editor, uh, I think being paid hourly and uh, kind of uh, fleshing out. And within, I think, three months, the assignment manager uh, ended up just not showing up for a while. So I got kind of thrown into the, the fire, so to speak, and uh, did the assignment manager thing there for a little over three years and got a call from Tina uh, at Bay News 9 and ended up moving there and working there for three years with wonderful people like yourself. So that was kind of my journey. And then once the contract was up, I think like many other TV newsers, it was kind of like time to move on and, and try other things. Like that. Very cool. And you went to the University of Florida, which is extremely well known for its journalism program. And uh, now I want to ask you, when you started out, like, did you, did you have a job in mind that you wanted to do in TV news? Or were you kind of just open to everything? No, honestly, I got a call, and, and this is a terrible story to share to be a professional, but uh, I was, I graduated, uh, I mainly had done radio and done some TV um, at UF, and really wasn't sure what path I was going to take. It was kind of in that, uh, you know, it'll figure itself out sort of a, a, a thing, and uh, a friend of mine, a colleague who was over there working, uh, gave me a call, I think it was at 8 a.m., and this was at a time when I had been partying the night before until uh, 5, 6 a.m., uh, so I get this call, and I'm still kind of uh, in a daze, and he's basically like, hey, they're looking for somebody to work weekend assignment editor job. Would you be interested? Of course, I'm like, I don't have a job. Yeah. And you're like, so what's I, an assignment editor, man? Right, exactly. exactly. I mean, it, at that at that time and in, in that headspace that I was in, I was just like, oh, a job? They have money and they're willing to pay me? Um, so I ended up just jumping up, getting a shower, going in. And it was like one of those things. I was kind of in a daze the whole thing. They offered me the job there. and Wait, you had to go in that day? <laughs> oh, like literally. Oh, my God. The interview was, I think, in within an hour oh. after he called me. He's like, hey, can you get in here today? And I was like, yep, why not? And jumped up and kind of put myself together and got in there. And they offered the job kind of on the spot. So um, a very interesting kind of foray into a professional career, basically drinking in the driveway with a bunch of friends <laughs> you know, four hours before going in for your first professional interview. You, nice. But, uh, well, clear, clearly uh, that helped you because you got you got the job. So it couldn't. I, have been I must have been saying something smart, or uh, it must have jugged something loose. So that's awesome. And uh, you know, hey, you didn't want to. You, you had to take that opportunity right away. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, was there something? What What was it to you that appealed about being in TV news? 
Um, you know what? Honestly, at first, I, I, so when I was uh, at UF, one of the great things about UF is they have their own public TV station and they have, uh, they had at the time, I think it's now sports, but they had AMA 50, um, WCJ or uh, WR, um, blank and I, uh, AMA 50, which was the, the news and talk uh, kind of radio. So a lot of uh, colleagues of mine who kind of went up into the TV side of things, whatever, kind of did their time at uh, AMA 50, but I, I just really loved it. And the nice thing too was, um, you know, spending summers there and stuff, you could get paid um, to basically work in radio in a real radio station. So uh, I did a lot more of that, ended up hosting what was called Front Page on the Air, which was uh, an hour long kind of news magazine show. And Tom and Forrest, who uh, were running the place, kind of gave us the freedom to put our own shows together, interview who we thought was uh, important, kind of gave us guidance, but uh, it was a really cool experience every day. Um, basically, I think five days a week, four days a week, we were um, kind of checking on what the news of the world was, trying to find ways to localize it, um, covering local Gainesville politics, and uh, you know, really getting tried things out. We were like trying you know, live interviews and stuff like that, which weren't done at the time. So I really kind of came out of college thinking like, oh, I'm gonna get into radio, but as we all know, radio was, even at the time, uh, not really kind of on the up and up. So uh, that was when it was kind of like, okay, let's, let's try the TV thing and, and see what's there. But I actually I kind of regretted that I didn't do more with TV uh, at UF, kind of the way things went, because it was a lot of learning uh, while on the job once I got into it. You know, it is kind of funny now, even though radio might be on the decline podcasting now is so absolutely <laughs> it's kind of, that's kind of crazy that we're kind of coming full circle and now that you know that form of media is really popping right now yeah no it's and i look back at a lot of the stuff that we did then and it was kind of like uh it's it's exciting to know that people are back into you know podcasts and stuff like that and people have earbuds in listening to to the news on those it just i guess it took maybe 10, 15 years for the, you know, format and whatnot to catch up to what Coming people back. Well, yeah, and exactly. so I have to ask you, during your time at Florida, you had an interesting encounter with someone we all know, um, Olympic swimmer Ryan Lochte. Do you okay, care to yep. share this story with us? Because I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's funny because it, uh, it wasn't even, you know, planned and nobody knew at the time. So I was, um, I was at a party at UF, one of my buddies from high school uh, ended up being on the track team for a while. Um, so we got to hang out with, with athletes at these parties. And, and one particular party we were at, um, it was your, your typical keg party. And uh, people were lining up for the keg. And I was standing there kind of filling up people's beers. And uh, a group of uh, younger kids, I'm trying to make, I wasn't that much older than them, but they were all freshmen. Uh, came in and we had run out of cups. So um, I started just kind of grabbing random receptacles that were in the vicinity and telling them that this was their cup for the night. Um, so it was like handing kids Tupperware containers and uh, just stuff like that, bowls from the, the cupboards and whatnot. And then this one kid who apparently was getting a lot of buzz at the time uh, came up and I filled up, there was a Frisbee on a table nearby and I filled up a Frisbee with beer and told him to chug it. And as I'm doing this, there's a whole group that's kind of gathered around that just starts, you know, kind of yelling at him to chug it. Um, so this kid ends up chugging, you know, this Frisbee, slamming it down, everybody cheers, kind of a big thing. Find out later uh, when, you know, he starts doing well, that that was Ryan Lochte who uh, ended up becoming, you know, not only just a Olympic medalist, but, you know, a reality TV star and all the kind of controversy surrounding him. So. Um, so it was kind of fun when the first time that he was in the Olympics ended up kind of writing it up in a blog one night after kind of joking with friends about it and it kind of caught on a little bit. So uh, Ryan Lochte chugging beer out of a Frisbee uh, has become kind of his a humble. Actually, that's probably one of the high points in his life after. I mean, <laughs> did you ever see that John Oliver segment about Ryan Lochte? It was not at all flattering. Like Not much of the coverage no. around Ryan Lochte. And the, what was that show? What would Ryan do or something? Like oh, I yeah. saw, an, I think I saw one episode where he was like trying to date or something. And I was like, man. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 funny. You hear a lot of stories about him from from college. I, I mean, that was yeah, my... before he was getting robbed at gas stations and all that. Stuff. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. My one and only interaction with him uh, was doing that. There's a butterfly effect, and maybe that led to all the poor decisions he made <laughs> later. And really, I'm at fault, but. Um, but no, that was a, a very interesting night. I know you're responsible. You're responsible for his uh, for his downs downward spiral, Brian. Yeah, no, we can all trace it back to that one yeah, night. That one night like of movie butterfly effect where he goes back and tries to like do it differently, and I keep forcing him to to chug beer out of prison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that again, yeah, again, meet and meet and famous and influential people at the University of Florida, right? Oh yeah, that's <laughs> definitely a unique story. Yeah. So, okay, so obviously we, we work together. You were one of, and I have to say, you were not only so good at what you did on, as being a SEM editor, you were also one of the funny, honestly, honest to God, one of the funniest people I've ever worked with. And you were, you always had people smiling, you know, no one could be in a bad, bad mood around you and everybody loved you. So um, that's what I remember of you from Bay Thank you, yeah. Um, I also remember your epic night notes, you, um, made this look so effortless, but you would, every, uh, after the end of your shift, the assignment editors usually, usually have to do some sort of shift report. Yep, yep. And you would write these elaborate themed notes, like where you would take everything and like theme it for Star Wars or something. Like, <laughs> but, like you would change all the reporters' names. Like, I don't know how you came up with that stuff, but like, or, you know, but like you did. And it was always, like everyone always really enjoyed everything about you. Well, so. you, I mean, you've worked night shifts before in the <laughs> news industry, right? I mean, so, there, there's nights where it's nonstop action and it's, you know, kind of going, but I mean, by and large, and we always used to kind of joke about uh, things are Q-U-I-E-T. Uh, and you don't, you never say that loud either. You don't want to jinx, you don't want to jinx it. You. Yeah, I mean, and it's fun when things are moving, but it usually is moving because something bad has happened. Yeah. You don't uh, want it to you know. move too much, you know, you're good right. with steady pace. Nice, steady, good amount of news, good mix. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've worked those shifts and it's like, you know, there's some nights where it's like, you're almost trying to make something happen. And, and I just figured uh, in those situations, it was kind of like, if I'm gonna have to kind of leave a note for everybody to have to read to know what kind of happened overnight and what the continuing stories are, like, I've kind of learned if you inject things with a little bit of humor, A, people will read it instead of just saying, yeah, oh, yeah, I got it. Um, but it also just, you know, humor can always, I think, help people, um, especially in TV news where it's like, you know, you go to the morning meeting, it's like, okay, which murder are we covering and which one isn't newsworthy enough of a murder? Um, you know, TV news people typically have really solid senses of humor yeah, sometimes very sometimes sick a little, dark, yeah sometimes a little dark just because of stuff <laughs> we're dealing with you know and you're like is it too soon you're like ah eh, you know <laughs> never too soon in news. Never yeah. too soon. well um can you kind of describe to people what does an assignment editor do yeah it's a it's a weird position and i think it does kind of differ from place to place what um what basically i try to tell people is that you know the assignment desk and the assignment editor is kind of the brain uh trust of the room they're they're almost kind of quarterbacking to a certain extent the incoming and outgoing news um it's it's part kind of managing and making sure that all your resources from reporters to photographers are all uh, in the right places being moved around to where the news is at uh, but then also it's a lot of monitoring a lot of planning a lot of making sure that you're kind of setting the table uh, so that the producers have enough to work with and uh, reporters are put into a good position a lot of setting people up for success and um, a lot of uh, kind of just vetting things out that's a, a lot of what it is and um, you know uh, it's it's you're the person who answers the phones and it could be a crazy viewer. Or it could be your next top story. Um, it's a lot of checking in with contacts and building relationships because especially in a place like Tampa where you've got uh, five different uh, TV stations and, you know, people are fairly competitive. Um, you want to be the first one to be able to break the story. You want to be the first one to be able to get to the, um, you know, the news makers uh, of the day and, and again, set up the reporters and producers for success. So it's kind of like that, uh, uh, the backbone. I like to think of it uh, uh, of the newsroom where you're, you're really kind of uh, filtering uh, everything or just kind of presenting everything and then letting the, the producers make the decisions to, to make sure everything comes together nicely and things are written well um, and that the reporters and photographers are put into a place where they can have the best chance of 
uh, of having a good story. So a lot of a lot of different kind of wearing different way to hats. Describe and, it. Yeah, it's 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 a tough one to really nail down until you're in the newsroom. Yeah, and people outside the business, nobody really knows what it is either. Like you, you know, everyone wants to talk to the anchor and the reporter. Right. Realize <laughs> they got to go through you first. Like it's yeah. not you. You're actually like that job is one of the most important in the newsroom. And if you don't know what it is, and you're in media relations or PR, clearly that's that's a bad thing. Well, all right. Yeah. Offhand, I want to ask: um, Do you remember some of the strangest crazy calls? Crazy. <laughs> um, there were a lot. There were a lot, um, and it's funny depending on depending on what mode the newsroom was in, because a lot of times, especially when we we worked at uh, Bay News Night, which I think is Spectrum Nine now. Yeah, uh, I know. they, they were Spectrum bought Bay out by like Nine. Spectrum Cable or something. Yeah. So, um, especially in twenty four hour news, and this is probably more true today than ever before because it was social media and stuff like that. You can break stories from your phone now uh, on Twitter. So, uh, you know, when the, when the newsroom's really cranking and, you know, you're trying to track down interviews for reporters, you're trying to track down uh, details of a story that your anchor can read and break into with live coverage. Like when the crazy calls happen, then um, I could be a little less, yeah, sometimes you have more time for them and other times you're like, I got to right. get off the phone, lady. Right, because I, I genuinely loved having <laughs> crazy calls here and then if it happened at a time like on a night when nothing's going on. Um, I, 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 I mean, there were, there were a few kind of specific ones that I do kind of remember. Um, there was one, and this was when I was in Gainesville, and it was a, a time of day or whatever where things were you know, slow enough that I could kind of really listen. But this was like your typical, like crazy person um, who believed that they were both Jesus and Buddha and just, you know, a bunch of different deities all wrapped into one. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, but there were, I mean, it was, it was something that like, I wish I was recording it because it was so beautiful what he kind and of- And that's the thing, like when you're in news, you have so many of these, but you can't share them publicly until like really you leave that business. Oh, But absolutely. there are so many good ones that you wish you could like do a book or a blog or something. Oh yeah. They're no, so entertaining. And, and thinking back, really should have kind of taken down <laughs> notes on these because there were uh, some incredible ones, but that was a good one. We uh, had a woman who saw the Virgin Mary in a door and sent pictures and I, when those would happen at Bay News 9 and I, I think uh, Tina and Mike and Allie would uh, attest like I would act like I was real into them thinking that <laughs> these were really news stories we need to cover and like annoyingly so just keep going back to them like ah, we need to talk about this I mean this is something that you know somebody else is going to do the story and we're going to and they're like Brian stop it we're not doing the Virgin Mary in the door story I'm like okay fine um but th those were kind of fun when you get like those those crazy ones like that. Um, but because I was doing TV news in Florida, it's funny now living in Chicago, people always talk about, you know, Florida man and all these kind of crazy, like it had to happen in Florida. And it's like, yeah, I sat at it. And more often than not, we ended up covering a lot of those crazy stories because they were real. Like it wasn't just crazy callers. Um, but then you get some of those not so great callers who say creepy things about- Didn't you? Uh, I remember you had a guy, he called you and you talked to him. He claimed he was going to like shoot people or something. And by the end of the phone call, you had convinced him not to shoot people. And he also <laughs> told you he was going to get on a bus and go to like work net or something. Like you, you, you said that. I was like, that is awesome. Like he was real pissed off or something. And by the end of the call, you had convinced him not to go that route, which again is, is an accomplishment in itself, but you know? Yeah, a lot of them would end up just cussing me out and hanging yeah. up. But, you know, there were a couple of times I was able to counsel. and Yeah, maybe and try to convince them that was not the right move, you know. I figured you don't want to be part of the news story no. situation. So it's always good to err on the side of, of caution that they really are going to do some of the things that they say they're going to do. But, um, but yeah, I mean, by and large, uh, nothing that was, like, ridiculously uh, out of the norm that I feel like any other – person who's answering phones in the TV newsroom would have would have heard just lots and lots of craziness and I have to ask so what in your opinion what are kind of the best and worst parts about working in that business Ooh, that's a yeah. loaded question yeah. um I mean I do miss that that competitiveness and that go 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 and um you know there was that adrenaline rush that I think anybody that's been in news or uh, is still in news kind of feeds off of that kind of 
wanting to beat the competition on stories, but also like really wanting to get the story right because you do have that responsibility to your audience to, to be the ones who are the gatekeepers of what's important for them to know and make sure you're presenting it in a way that, you know, they're actually getting value from it and can make decisions. And, uh, you know, the safety of their families is always a big thing and uh, trying to keep that in mind. So I do miss some of that. And I, I mean, there is, um, there is some good that can come out of, you know, exposing, um, you know, people who are wronging others and, and stuff like that. And I think that's, that's the good stuff. And then I think, um, you know, it's just a tough business. It's, it's yeah. one where, um, you know, you're constantly having to cover the doom and gloom to make sure that people understand that, but do it in a way where you're being, um, uh empathetic i guess to to people so i mean it's like some of the some of the police reports you end up reading about these people who um you know are, are molesting children oh, or, or you know some of the things that it's yeah, like those are the worst you, you really in that role uh and working in kind of news especially like a 24-hour news station or something like that like you really see the evil of the world kind of daily and it's one of those things where and I've talked to a lot of uh, friends who either were in the biz, are still in the biz, or got out, but you kind of carry that home where you go yeah. home, and it's like you have this jilted kind of sense that the world is its not that great when you see all this, but then there's those like, like rays of sunshine where you're able to kind of help somebody out through a, a good story or shine light on, um, you know, something good going on in the community, and it kind of, it's this weird balance where you're going back and forth between the doom and gloom of this world is awful to, Oh no, it's actually pretty awesome. Uh, so, so that's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of uh, dichotomy of, of good and bad kind of day to day. Is it going to be more Jekyll or is it going to be more Hyde? And you never really know in those days where it's all Hyde, you kind of go home and just stare at the wall going, you know, what the hell kind of world am I living in? So yeah, that's a good point. Is there, uh, out of all the stories you've covered, is there one in particular that just really stands out as having a personal impact on you? Um, there, there were a few. I mean, one that, just talking about the Ray of Sunshine sort of a thing, I remember there was one that we did um, when I was at Bay News 9 where uh, email came in from a viewer or something like that. I can't remember exactly how it uh, originated, but it was talking about um, there was a scam going on, I think it was through Craigslist, where uh, people were donating money to uh, this thing to buy Christmas presents. And I'm trying to remember all the particulars, but um, ended up kind of digging into it, finding the person who was behind it. We confronted her with it. Um, and because of that, we ended up doing a story where we exposed this uh, woman who was kind of scamming people out of money. And uh, it, it was something like, you know, send us money and you'll get presents. Either way, the there were, you know, probably about 20 to 30 families that were kind of screwed in this deal. Um, and because we ended up uh, exposing it, doing the story, um, I remember we did a follow-up story when there were a bunch of people in the community that came together, donated their own money, presents, stuff like that. So these families that weren't going to have a Christmas ended up having presents and, and all this stuff. And like, you feel good when it's like, if, if I would have just deleted that email or, yeah. you know, we would have as an organization deemed that it wasn't important enough and not put the resources toward it, then that would just happen. That Christmas uh, would have been ruined for those people. So that was one that I felt like, remember watching the story and the way that we handled it, I felt real good about, you know, what we're doing uh, in TV news. But um, I also, uh, some of the things that on, on you know, were, were just tragic and, and terrible things. Uh, we had several uh, law officers who were killed in line of duty um, when we were, when I'm out, I, we were in Tampa. Um, and then before that uh, happened in Gainesville. And I remember in those kind of situations, really seeing like how powerful, um, you know, what we did as a news organization was because you end up, you know, talking to family members, those who knew them, get the community kind of rallying around. And it's that it was those moments where you really felt a responsibility uh, and wanted to be the people kind of in that position to be able to take a look at this, say, we have a job to do. People need to know about this. We need to explore this. We need to uh, kind of tell their stories, but honor their memories at the same time. Um, and I think those were like real uh, interesting moments because out of such, you know, tragedy and such terrible things, you know, watching a newsroom come together and everybody kind of be on the same page of we don't want to mess this up. We don't want to uh, do this the wrong way. We want to be respectful, but make sure that the community can grieve and, and we as uh, 
uh, a news organization can kind of put the information out there. So, so those those kind of moments, um, there was a uh, Danny Rawling uh, in Gainesville who committed these heinous uh, murders in Gainesville of college students uh, long before my time. Um, they executed him in Stark, which is in the coverage area for uh, for WCJB. And I mean, I'm 22. Oh, yeah, because that's one of those areas. Every time there was an execution, you're like, who's, yeah. who's going to this thing? It's Stark. <laughs> yeah, if, 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 they're, uh, if we're sending a bunch of news crews to Stark, like, oh. he's not going to be there. And the it's next so, day. yeah, it's so far. Like, <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, that was one where it was like, I'd heard the stories and, you know, going to UF, you, you know about it, there's a wall that they kind of had a, a thing dedicated, painted, but, um, but for, we did coverage for, I think maybe two weeks a week uh, leading up to it and just being in the center of that and uh, being able to kind of listen to the stories of people who lived through that and how this was such a cathartic moment for so many people that, you know, they had to live through this very scary kind of time when this guy was on the loose, and and also, you know, the people who were who were touched and and, and kind of related to these these people lost their life from a serial killer. Um, to to hear the stories of these people and get to play a role in our coverage to kind of bring closure um, to this 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 terrible chapter. Uh, those moments again, it's weird to say that that was when I really enjoyed news, but it, it, it made you feel like what you were doing had purpose. And if you did it in the right way and you kind of respected the responsibility that you had, um, you could turn very terrible things into, uh, like I said, kind of cathartic or, or kind of closure moments for people uh, and leave that day knowing that you kind of informed the community of something that was important, uh, but did so in a way that you were, you were being respectful of, of the people impacted by it. I really appreciate you sharing that. And on the flip side too, after I went to CNN, um, on my end, it was really cool. Whenever there was a, a story that was of national, international interest, um, I was so always so proud of how, like just the incredible work, uh, especially some of these small markets did on huge stories, uh -huh. um, you know, that really relied on their local expertise and, and just hard work on the ground. Um, but it is kind of neat to see them highlighted for what they're doing. Um, on a much larger scale, you know, sort of like the the Las Vegas stations, now the Miami stations and the and the Fort Lauderdale stations. So uh, these people work so hard. And I feel like that's something that doesn't often get recognized. Um, <laughs> and I want to ask, um, do you feel like there's something you would want to share with the people watching? Um, maybe something about the media industry that you feel people like don't understand or might have like the wrong idea about? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we right now is the most bizarre time that I've ever seen and in, 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 uh, when the media is concerned and, you know, obviously uh, with Trump uh, kind of throwing out the, the gauntlet and, you know, fake news thing and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's a very odd uh, world we live in right now. And I think it's more important than ever. Um, you know, I got out of the business, but I still very much respect journalism at its core and very much respect, you know, the tenets of, um, you know, making sure that, you know, you're, you're getting all the facts and things are presented in a way because there is that responsibility, um, you know, to be that gatekeeper, to, you know, to be the one who's kind of letting people know and informing them um, without any bias. But, you know, it's, I think a lot of people because of the fake news thing and because of some of the um, sensationalism that exists in the media today, which I think is unfortunate, um, I think look at all news. It kind of colors uh, all journalism. Um, you know, when you have certain TV hosts who slant one way or, or do things in a sensationalistic manner, uh, you have a lot now more even print and online publications that take very obvious slants or, you know, do things just for the sensationalism. Uh, it just, it's, it's scary and it's dangerous um, that there's this broad stroke that people don't feel like they can trust any of the media because, I mean, every newsroom I was in, um, you know, there was a very uh, vehement uh, protection of those journalistic values, journalistic integrity. Um, yeah, you get you get the squirrel on, on water skis once in a while and, and stuff like that. And there's, there's hey, you got to do the animal story. You have to do, do the animal stories. stories. Um, but I think that's that's the biggest thing that that I'm afraid of is seeing the evolution of where things are headed and the amount of misinformation, the amount of sensationalism that's out there that's causing really good journalists and really um, uh, in media outlets with a lot of journalistic integrity to get 
again, painted with the same strokes that you can call fake news or, or kind of, you know, that kind of stuff and, and people who are really kind of fighting to protect such a very extremely important freedom, um, you know, the freedom of the press to inform people. Um, that That's a scary thing that I think a lot of uh, people, especially, I think it's important to educate um, the next generation, the younger people who uh, don't remember when it was just, you had a few kind of physical newspapers that you opened and you read them in the morning and then you had your your local news at night and a couple network stations i mean things have exploded so much that they're being exposed to all this um all these different kind of viewpoints and all these different uh treatments uh of of news and i think it's important more than ever that we're educating uh them to understand you know which are the ones to trust uh, which are the ones to kind of take with a grain of salt, uh, and the lines are blurring a lot more uh, these days. But at the heart of it, especially in, in, in local news uh, and, and whatnot, and especially some of the stuff they're doing from an investigative journalism standpoint, a lot of the, the big newspapers, um, you know, I, I think I think that's something that a lot of people uh, don't know that should is in in the amount of uh, tireless effort, work, and energy that goes into a quick uh, online feature or uh, into an article uh, in the newspaper, uh, some of these very impactful ones that are uncovering uh, injustice and wrongdoing and stuff like that, just the sheer toil that goes into that uh, from journalists who uh, are doing it the right way because yeah. not doing it the right way, then it's very easy to just slap stuff out there. It, you know, the people who are doing the right way are the ones that are losing you know, sleep, uh, you know, not sleeping some nights and uh, putting together um, these things that are really making an impact. So I want to ask you about viral stories. Uh, you've covered, probably covered quite a few viral stories during your career, and I'm sure you kind of track them as they come along. Do you feel like there are some attributes that these stories like tend to have in common? Um, well, there's a cat. That's going to go viral. <laughs> yeah, there was a cat. Oh, oh she's... <laughs> Oh, geez. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> well, she, decided she wanted a nap She's, right in the back. Taking a nap. Yeah, there she is. Hold on. Na nap cat could go nap cat, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't have any kids that are going to bust in though, so that's <laughs> that's a plus. We can do that in pre-pro, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can. I can. Um, after effects in <laughs> some fake kids. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. I mean, so many things can go viral these days. It's almost like uh, the further we go with the social media and stuff like that, the you know, celebrities, the influencers, the people who have the followers are the ones that are kind of dictating that. So it's kind of interesting. They're almost the new gatekeepers for what is kind of going viral. Now, thankfully, to a certain extent, it's, it's you know, animal videos and clips from The Tonight Show and stuff like that that are, uh, by and large, I think, quote unquote, being the viral videos. Um, but man, I, I don't know. I, I guess if there was a, a, a recipe for what would go viral, every marketing agency and every PR agency and, you know, whatever would be trying to check all those boxes to make sure. But I think it's like anything else. At the end of the day, it's going to come back to uh, interesting people, animals. There's got to be a character involved. Uh, and it's got to be something that people haven't seen before. Uh, or just touch on something that everybody can relate to. I mean, that's that's what news and anything else is. I think the, the things that go viral are things that are either just so bizarrely different than what's out there, or they follow those same kind of tropes of, of, of kind of, uh, you know, a lot of these kind of viral celebrities like Chewbacca Mom or, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the videos of- Or a Rhoda, you, you've seen Rhoda Young Live, right? What is it? The Rhoda Young Live, the lady, the lady at the fire. Uh, you know the one where she's like, I'm on the scene of this yes, bitch or whatever? Yes. <laughs> that was like, I think, I, I do, I, I, I've i noticed she's got her own thing going on, but I do think somebody should hire her because. Oh, absolutely. That would be, mean, she's oh. making money somehow. The fact yeah. that you're talking about her, she's making money somehow. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. It's it's hard to predict. I mean, I don't think, uh, with, with and that's a funny thing. We've actually talked about that now on the on the dark side of, of PR marketing. It's like, we'll, we'll have clients who be like, oh, we want a viral video or we want something to go viral. It's like, eh, the whole, the whole, yeah, we like your video. Um, viral yeah. is be because you didn't force it. Yeah. it stuff that's forced uh, doesn't uh, go viral. If you try to create something viral, you're going to be creating something that nobody's going to care about. You know, what? you know what is kind of funny to see some of these um, online outlets have these like contrived viral videos. Like the ones I'm talking about are like, 
you know, the Buzzfeed like ten dollar steak versus ten thousand dollar steak. Or uh, <laughs> you remember that guy? He did the one where like he filled a swimming pool with like Coca Cola and Mentos and th- flew a drone into it, like stuff like that. Where you're like, really? Like, where people yeah, are? Just, kind of like, I'm gonna have to look that up. After it was this. it was crazy, and I think it was it. <laughs> Another channel, they had that controversial video where they um, had like a container full of cockroaches and they poured like molten metal into it. Like, so some people are really trying to like contrive these videos and they are getting <laughs> a lot of views. But sometimes like with the, with the cockroach one, people are like, like it was more controversial because they were like hurting the cockroaches. Wow. Uh, but I think BuzzFeed is actually doing some pretty interesting interesting things with their video series they get i mean i don't know what constitutes viral now but they do get several million hits of course on youtube now it's all about the kid videos the toy unboxings and the um superhero and disney princesses acting out crazy stuff but those there's there's definitely there's definitely little like things that you can combine together i mean you can engineer something that has a chance of being it but i think the real viral ones are the ones that kind of almost happened by a happy accident. Um, but yeah, you, like you were right. talking about the the professor that had like the live shot interrupted by like the kids and stuff. Like, Absolutely, yeah. Like stuff like that. That's Yeah, like the best ones are not planned, but it is fine, funny on YouTube to see these people like really trying uh-huh. so hard to get these like clickbaity videos, you know, like, or like, you know, guys wear high heels for a week, see what happens, you know. <laughs> or have you seen the one that's called like the high guys where it's like, people who are high they just like do random stuff like decorate cakes or something or i mean that's entire states of the, <laughs> you know, like these I mean, like just is that just denver i mean it, it's, it's all the whole state of denver you know now whatever well, uh, i think isn't it legal in oregon now or something like there are a few different yeah. states i think massachusetts which doesn't even have an infrastructure to grow marijuana but you know whatever <laughs> i don't know the, hey, that's just gonna spread there, there's gonna be a market community, so yeah yeah. Well, okay. So obviously you kind of switched over to the media, to the marketing side. Now, do you have advice coming from your news background for people um, who want to try to do public relations and media relations, but you know, maybe aren't getting their emails returned or aren't having very much success with the TV. You're state? talking about getting a job or, or uh, just getting uh, you know, just getting media coverage. Like, yeah, like I mean, the- you do, who would pitch you stories. Well, it's funny, and, and I've, I've kind of said this before in, in my job now at No Limit, um, is I remember being, uh, we talked about the crazy callers earlier, I was way less patient, I think, with the obvious PR people. <laughs> I was and like, did you get my press release? Absolutely. And and I, like, I, uh... I used to play a game where I would just say, oh, hold on real quick, we have breaking news, or something like that, put it on hold and just see how long they <laughs> stay on hold. And then it's terrible and it's cruel and I was young and now I'm paying for all of those things. I know, because now you're on the other, high. now you're the one pitching the stories. How long would they stay on hold for? Uh, we've, we had a couple, I'd be like, we're at uh, seven minutes, guys, seven minutes or something. <laughs> you know, it's just a terrible uh, way to treat people and, uh, you know, they definitely deserve it. And or de- definitely did not deserve it. And I've had uh, reporters, producers that I've talked to uh, not not treat me that way because I, I would know the game uh, because I originated it. Um, but just the ones that, you know, they hear PR, they, they whatever, and uh, they kind of cut you off before you have a chance to, to kind of share it. So I'm definitely, like I said, paying for that. But I mean, I think it really comes back to uh, the, the, and I used to talk at a few things when, I uh, worked at Bay News 9. They'd have like uh, kind of PR groups get together. And um, I, you know, spoke on a couple panels for that. And my, my, my thing was always like, if, if, if it's not something that you feel like you could see on the news or it's not something you could read in the newspaper, you're wasting their time by, by uh, kind of reaching out. And one thing I like that, that we do and what, I, what, what I've tried to do kind of to impart my knowledge from working on the other side of things is uh, just the way you approach people. Even uh, if you blast out press releases and it's just like that kind of calling every other, not even every other day, but every day, just like, did you get the press release? Like, well, yeah, but what's the story? Like, I don't have time to read your two page press release and figure out what element of it. So we, re- we really try to get to the point. And uh, I think that's been uh, such a, a good tactic is like, don't waste their time with, you know, the flowers and the whatever. It's like, what's the story here? Like, 
why do I care about this now? Why do I care about this in my market? How would I cover this? The more you kind of do, and, and because things are so busy, I tell them like, the more you set them up, like here's yeah, they all- They don't have time. They, like oh, that's yeah. the thing, these people in newsrooms do not have time no. to read your entire company history. No, and that's the thing is I, I think that's a, a, I think people are coming around uh, on that, that front, but, but yeah, I think that's the main thing is just like, you, you know, have a news person's mentality when you're going into how you're pitching something. Uh, I mean, press releases by and large are kind of, to me, they're, they're a dead art form. They're a dinosaur. Yeah. They serve a purpose for SEO now and they serve a purpose to frame things up and to, to kind of provide people with background. So there are some uses for them, but by and large from a local perspective, especially like they're going to care, like why would my viewers care about this? Why do I care now? And you know, what are you providing me? So I don't have to spend hours kind of putting together something uh, for this to work. So I think that's, that was how, and, and have an eye for what's newsworthy. I mean, there's a lot you can do just by watching the news and, you know, knowing what is and isn't going to be deemed newsworthy in a newsroom. Um, so I think that's all uh, putting everything through the prism of, of a news person's kind of brain and, and how that works, I think, um, is the best way to do PR, not just do it in a lazy way of, oh, I'll write a press release and send it to these 10 different people and they're going to come back to me. You also have to kind of Go and you have to know that they don't get back to you. Like they're not going to get back to you. Like unless, <laughs> unless it's something really important, you might like if it's an event, they're not going to be able to tell you two weeks ahead if they're coming or not. Like that's we'd always yeah. get calls. Are you guys coming? To, uh, like we don't know yet. Like we we can't know. Uh, yeah, and that's the funny thing too. And and I used to. It's funny. I, I when I was at Bay News Nine, and even I think before that in Gainesville when we have kind of stuff that it wasn't like BS uh, PR stuff. It was stuff that, you know, our viewers would probably care about. Um, I used to tell them, and this was way before, I think it was as easy as it is now, but take video, take pictures. If we can't be there physically, we might still be able to use that uh, if you send it over. So that's one thing that, that, you know, we do um, in my current job where it's like, you know, let's make sure that our clients are documenting all this and let's get it to them as quick as possible. Um, because with resources being so limited, but there being literally infinite space for them to post things on their website or even social media now, like, uh, you might actually get more eyeballs on something if they're tweeting it out or posting on Instagram for some TV stations. Uh, then you're just, web, yeah, if it's a web story or you create, yeah. like, you know, you, you send them some really, you know, cool looking video and they end up putting that on Facebook, something like that. Yeah, some of that has, has more yeah. value today than if it's a blip on the news and somebody didn't catch it at that exact moment. Yeah. You know, uh, social media unless it's Snapchat, uh, lives forever. And stuff on the web, you can use those materials and on the PR side kind of repurpose them uh, by sharing them through social media and stuff like that. So there's almost more uh, value in those if that can happen. Uh, obviously, if you get the clip and stuff like that, you can do with that. But there's just so many more options, I think, today uh, available to people uh, if they tailor it the right way and understand how you know the new side of things works. You know who really is doing a very good job of being media savvy. And I think we all know this guy, Pope, uh, Pope County Sheriff, Grady Judd. <laughs> I just um, saw something from him oh my gosh. two days ago. Like, or, yeah. All right, so this guy, you know, if you guys aren't familiar watching, he is a sheriff. Um, it's, it's in like the middle, it's in like central Florida. It's sort of in between Tampa and Orlando. But mm -hmm. I remember working the weekends and they would send out press releases at just the right time you know, for something that was like lead worthy. So it would be like something that was an important enough thing where you could do a package on it, like have a reporter mm -hmm. cover it. And he would be like, I'll be at this intersection for the next two hours. You know, I'll, I'll give you some sound. So basically they were like spoon feeding you a story. And I think that's what, if you want to get media attention, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. This guy gives great press conferences, great sound bites, and he streams all of his stuff live. So if you want to take a lesson, follow <laughs> Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd. He like, do you remember how many times he saved your bot in like a Saturday? Like, <laughs> you like, I have nothing. And then he would send you some like weird, like super weird story. And you're like, yes, I've got something now. Oh, they, they were, I mean, they were way ahead because I think I've seen at the time there weren't a lot of uh, public information offices that were like 
basically putting on a show. And, and again, you know, Sheriff Judd. Yeah, it's a bit of a dog called, and pony show, but like everybody kind of knows that's what it is. You right. Know? Yeah. I mean, like, he, right. it was a right, it was the perfect <laughs> mixture of him having such an uh, engaging, but like he knew how it worked. So they, he, they would put press releases out or, or media alerts out that would have the quotes that you were going to get yeah. from there that you knew were going to be, uh, you know, real talkers. Uh, and, and props to Carrie and, and the rest of the team over at the Polk County Sheriff's Office because, you know, you knew that they were doing this and it was going to be a way that they could handle, you know, the story and get coverage for, for what they were doing. But, but man, they, they knew how things worked and really kind of played into that. So it was almost like you, you knew you were being played to a certain extent, but it was like, this is, this is good TV. But they, you know, and they were making your job a lot, a heck of a lot easier. You know, you're like, <laughs> especially on the weekends. Like I can't tell you how many times, like literally they would give us a lead story right oh, in the, wow. and they always sent out the press releases at a good time. It'd be like 9 a.m. Oh, and, they were, you know, yeah, plenty of time for your day side reporter to go over there and get what they needed. He would be at the crime scene location so you could get all your B-roll there. He yep. would do perp walks. Do you remember how he would have, he would let reporters into those prostitution stings? Oh boy, yeah. Like, I good. remember Josh <laughs> Rojas going to like more than one of those where they would let you into the house and like get the people that were being busted. Oh, they'd have roundups, they'd give you, oh, I mean, just. That guy was great. And, and it's funny, they were like, they were way ahead of that because I think right before probably I started, this is probably uh, late 90s, early 2000s. I think there was still like a lot of that uh, kind of distrust or not wanting to kind of put a lot out there on the law enforcement side. And I think uh, places like uh, Polk County Sheriff's Office and I, I remember even Alachua County Sheriff's Office and Gainesville, when I was working there. Um, you know, they really were making strides towards. Uh, being open and, and kind of providing uh, information and, and, and that sort of a thing, which I think was like a new thing. But those who kind of jumped on it early and understood that, you know, you, you kind of give some access to, to news reporters, stuff like that. Uh, there's a chance if you build up the relationship and stuff like that, if you have a bad thing happen within your agency, um, I don't want to say you're going to get preferential treatment, but you know, you've built up that relationship that, you know, it's not going to be as damning of a thing. Uh, and you're getting, you know, you're getting the trust of the public. And that's something that I think they started realizing is, you know, you get out there in front of this stuff, uh, you know, they're, they're more likely to maybe uh, shoot a VO or a VOSAD at, you know, one of the community building events that you're doing. Uh, and it's just good for, you know, the overall law enforcement agency. If, you're giving uh, the news opportunities to put you in a positive light or put you out there so that the community uh, trusts you more, that they, they feel, you know, better about you, that, that there's a more positive feeling there. Yeah, I mean, everybody, I mean, he's known nationwide now because he's so media friendly. Like he did oh, yeah. CNN all the time. Again, it was sort of the same, like never met a camera he didn't like. Like, that was, <laughs> yeah, like there are some people we've noticed that are kind of like that. Like they just, they don't say no to media attention. Because I realize it's publicity. Oh yeah, no, I mean, and and they they luck. I don't want to say lucked out, but his personality lent. Yeah. He he was a, uh, ahead of his time, I think. Because it, it's funny, I, I, like I said, I think I just saw uh, somebody post a video or something like that of him. Just oh yeah, they, they had like a best of. I saw like somebody post like kind of a best of video of him or something. Like, yeah, so he's still going yeah. strong out out there, and I, I think he will for a long time. So all these years later, okay, so um. <laughs> You obviously left the business about five years ago. Um, can you kind of tell me why you just like why you decided to get out, and also kind of where you've been since you left? <laughs> I went underground. I was you in, you, in the you viral. You your, your doomsday bunker. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I saw what was coming. So um, no, I, I, I just hit a point where, like we were talking about earlier, it's kind of uh, that doom and gloom is coming on your doorstep every day, and you know. Uh, having, you know, sol fallen soldiers having to, you know, kind of talk to their uh, loved ones who were left behind and, and kind of convince, not convince them, that sounds terrible, but uh, ask them and, and whatnot to, to do interviews. And then you're reading police reports of, about molestations and uh, all that stuff. It was kind of like, you know, bringing that home with me every day just didn't feel like it was going to be uh, long term, uh, uh, lead to long term happiness. So, uh, so that's why I, mainly I tried to or decided to get out of the business. Um, there's a lot too with with TV news that 
um, you know, the, the path to get to a place where, um, you know, you'd be happy. You have to bounce around to a lot of markets and stuff like that. And uh, I don't think I was willing at the time to really want to, you know, kind of ping pong uh, or pinball myself uh, around for that. Um, so, it, so I still was passionate about a lot of elements of it, but there was a lot that I didn't like. I uh, had a bunch of friends in Chicago that always uh, kind of done comedy and, and kind of been involved in that scene. So it was kind of like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I know that I have a lot of friends, uh, you know, in Chicago and, you know, want to be in a big city and kind of experience that because uh, I've lived in Florida from, you know, by the time I left to come to Chicago, I think I've been there since I was in eighth grade or something like that. Wow. So you're, yeah, you're, you're like kind of a native Floridian, which is actually kind of rare. Like <laughs> most people there I mean, don't, aren't from Florida. I mean, technically I was from, or lived you're, most of my childhood years in, in Cleveland, Ohio. So wait, you're from Cleveland, Ohio? Yeah, well, no. I born in Cincinnati, lived in Baltimore okay. for a little bit, but I, I lived in Cleveland from probably, what was I, uh, two, three years old until I was, uh, are you a military uh, kid or something or no, no, yeah. just, uh, just family kind of dad had uh, some different jobs, uh, that bounced around, but then it was kind of like we got to Florida when I was going into eighth grade and kind of stayed there through college and then through the first, you know, eight or so years. I don't blame your parents for that. That it, oh. the weather down here is far nicer than I'm very than jealous. And during this time of year, yeah. every year I question, uh, why I got out of there, but but yeah, I mean, that was it and wanted to kind of see um, how the other side lived to a certain extent. Um, so I kind of came to Chicago and just started looking for, for jobs in the PR industry and ended up finding one with No Limit Agency. I'm still there uh, five years later. So uh, thankfully, uh, somebody took a shot on me and, uh, you know, really kind of have, have grown to respect the public relations side of things more than I think I did back when I was uh, putting reporters on hold and uh, realized. That <laughs> now you're like, now you're the one that's being put out. Hopefully you don't get like a Brian <laughs> at Spectrum News 9 that's like, I'm going to be a jerk. And <laughs> no, it happens from time to time. And at, at first, after making the transition, uh, I'd get very angry when I was being kind of talked down to by, uh, by the people I used to have their kind of same job. But, um, it's uh it's not a daily occurrence thankfully when you must be obviously you must be really kicking ass there because you're a vp now which is amazing <laughs> what's your what's your job like there uh it's 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 involved a lot i mean we're we're still uh uh the company's been around for 10 years um and we're continually evolving so uh it's grown leaps and bounds pretty much every year i've been there so um, I think I just kind of came in at the right time and kind of came with the right background that was able to kind of uh, help influence some areas and, and kind of buy into uh, the system and the way that we do things. And uh, it's been an interesting ride. So it's, uh, there's a lot of different hats that uh, I still wear there, but uh, managing several different clients, uh, you know, pitching the media, coming up with stories that are going to resonate and um, a lot of that good stuff. So it's uh, day to day can be very different, but, uh, but it's exciting. Uh, similar to uh, kind of TV news where it's like you come in and expect one thing and other things pop up. So uh, I don't know if I'd ever like a job where it's like you come in and pull a lever. For, Are there less crazy calls there at least, maybe? There's less, uh, <laughs> there's less crazy calls. There might be more crazy uh, interactions or opportunities or, or things that, that pop up. Uh, no, I don't feel uh, same people's calls as much, um, but we have situations where, um, you know, we do kind of some of the crisis uh, PR. So you, you Ooh, hear. Yeah, that's gotta be, PR that's thing. gotta be interesting being on that side. Well, do you feel like a lot of your TV skills really translate into that area? Like, how do you, yeah. how was the transition like for you? Yeah. I mean, if anything, at first it was like kind of that, that weird feeling of like, um, uh, being on the other side, it's funny coming from news and, and kind of like going onto the other side. I had to learn pretty uh, quickly that stuff that maybe I wouldn't have uh, let pass through or, or deemed newsworthy, um, some markets do. And it's, it's kind of like you have to learn like what, what the, uh, the barometer is of each market that, that you end up talking to. There's some markets that uh, are way more open to doing things that are, have a kind of PR slant to it or that are featuring a business. Um, and then there's other kind of outlets or markets that, you know, are just very, I mean, at Bay News 9, it was one of the things that I, I really 
actually liked on that side was like if it smelled like PR we'd be very strict and yeah. uh, specific about it. we didn't have like a morning show where we were doing a lot of uh, more of those very PR kind of type things but uh, on the other side thank god that there are uh, stations that do that because uh, you know we we do kind of uh, end up generating a lot of uh, fun positive kind of press uh, for brands by putting them into kind of morning show situations and stuff like that. So I think at first it was kind of like having to drop the the very hard news hat and realize that, you know, there's ways to take um, PR stories, but kind of tweak them slightly so that there's a little bit more news related to them or uh, kind of find the angles and the elements to, um, you know, what brands and companies are doing. Um, that'll be newsworthy, but also kind of uh, put the brand or the, the company in a positive light. Well, and I was looking at your website, which by the way, you are on the homepage. I'll link it below as well. Um, <laughs> and I really liked some of your tenants. It was, they're very honest. One of the things that your company prides itself on is quote unquote, giving a shit. And yeah. I feel like a lot of companies are, are missing that. Um, so like, I don't know, what, how do you feel like, uh, the place you work at now, like really, like it, it definitely does seem like you guys are doing awesome. Uh, you've been working with a lot of clients, but you mm -hmm. know, what do you, like, what do you think, uh, you know, if someone's in like the digital marketing space, like, you know, that's, that's an interesting question to ask. Like, how do you really cut through the clutter and, and, and accomplish that? Um, and a lot of the, you know, I, I like businesses that are just that upfront and that transparent. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know? It can but, be jarring you know, to some folks. Um, uh, I'm 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 not a person who is afraid of cussing. Uh, I worked in TV news, so you know that when the cameras are off, that a lot of filthy sailor mouths in, yeah. uh, in TV news. Uh, but I, no, I, I like that it's blunt because I think it speaks to uh, it speaks to an attitude that uh, that we have, and I think is important in any business really. Um, where it's like, if you don't care what you're doing day to day, if you don't care about uh, the clients that you're servicing, if you don't care about the work that you're doing and the people around you, then you shouldn't be there. And I think that whole kind of give a shit is such a blunt way of saying like, like this or don't. Like if you don't get out, it's kind of uh, uh, kind of the mentality that I think you need to have pretty much in every business. But uh, it's one thing that I think uh, we kind of hold ourselves accountable for because you know, when you work in uh, the PR industry and uh, marketing, like you're serving, especially agency life, you're serving so many kind of different masters and, you know, you really have to care about the success of uh, the clients that you're working with and not just the clients you work with, but the people um, that you form those relationships with um, who, who work at the clients uh, and at the companies that you're working with. Because I think at the end of the day, like, uh, you know, going home and feeling like you made people's lives better uh, is the whole reason that we do uh, things. And you can't do that if you're kind of uh, phoning it in every day. So uh, and there are, the sad thing is there are a lot of people who really don't care that much and don't really yeah. <laughs> put in the effort, which is, which is kind of sad, but uh, you know, it's good. It's good that your company is so, um, is so focused on actually, you know, making, making it count. Um, so I want to talk about younger people. Obviously, it seems like your company has quite a few. People. We've reached that age where we can we're talk the younger about younger side. I know, and I'm and we're that's like the older ridiculous. ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like, and that's the thing. I, I, you know, I, I really have a heart for people who are like 18 to 22 now. I think it's going to be a very different path for them than it was for us. Yep. Um, what kind of advice would you give to a person right now who is interested in broadcast journalism? It can, don't go into the business. It can be here. This is what you should do uh, to get there. Like, what kind of advice would you give to someone for 2018? Uh, don't. No. I'm <laughs> just um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's 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 like anything else, and it's something that uh, I heard time and time again when I was in college, and maybe didn't invest uh, the right amount of time in it. But um, I think it's really you learn by doing, and the the fear of getting involved in something that you really are passionate about or, or think you'd be passionate about until you get into it and do it and try it. You can't really formulate an opinion on it. And I think uh, something that's going to make people stand out is um, really uh, buying into what it takes to make it in that industry. Cause at the same, at the same time that the, the industry has evolved and all the different platforms are there and I could 
sit here and talk about like, well, make sure that you're, you're tweeting once a day and make sure that, you know, your, your, your kind of Instagram's on point and uh, stuff like that. I think at the same time, you're going to be working in an industry where old codgers like us um, and, you know, they grew up a certain way. So there's still a respect for people that, uh, know what hard work looks like. There's still respect for people that show genuine interest. Uh, I think it's going to be the same. It'll, it'll just be a little bit different that, um, you know, working in, you know, Gainesville, which was Market 162 or something like that, you'd see people come in that wanted to be this big shot reporter or whatever, but would complain every single time that they were assigned a story they didn't like, or uh, the second that their story aired, they were out the door, not really working to improve. And working. Never did their web story, of course. Never. We just started doing the web story. That was, a, that was a, a funny thing I was talking to somebody about the other day. It was like, we just started us- utilizing our website, like right after I started TV News. And it was like, eh, we'll get to that later. That's not important. And now it's like, that's almost a, more important than anything else. But yeah, I think those kind of tenets of any, any kind of uh, hardworking and uh, putting yourself in there and really kind of earning your stripes is going to resonate with the people who are going to hire and ultimately kind of decide what career path uh, you go down. Um, and I think there's going to be kind of a backlash to, uh, I don't want to say backlash, but I think there's going to be a response to kind of the way things have gotten off the rails of uh, so many different sensationalist and, and slanted news and stuff like that. I think like everything in life, it's gonna be cyclical and people are gonna go back to really wanting that hard news journalism. And it's gonna take different forms as far as what the mediums are. Um, but I think uh, really being students of that game and, and learning that it's not just how you look on camera, it's not just how you sound, it's not just uh, how, cute or funny or interesting your story is but like that nitty-gritty digging into a story that's that's never going to change that yeah Yeah, no I agree I like I feel like um and I was talking to Mike Deason who was an investigative reporter journalism will there will always be a need for it Mm -hmm. but the form that it takes might be different in 20 years again it could all be you know live streaming on Netflix or something like we don't know um but I want to ask what do you feel like this the business needs to do um, in order to stay relevant? Like if you, you know, like if you could make a shift in the TV news industry, like yep. where would you lead it? Like, Ooh. I know, because obviously, you know, money, money shrinking and, you know, a lot of these online platforms are huge now, but fewer people are watching TV. Yeah. And I do think that it's going to get to a place where uh, I think people are fine with it being a little bit more, uh, down and dirty and a little bit more uh, kind of grassroots uh, reporting. I mean, uh, shit, everybody's a reporter now. Uh, if you're at the scene of something happening and you have a phone, you have become a reporter. And I think people in the past, uh, and I remember even being in the news thinking like, oh, nobody's nobody's taking these people seriously or this Twitter thing is never going to catch on and, and stuff like that. It's, it's I think, there's going to be more of an appetite for that down and dirty right in the middle of things uh, kind of, but, but people are okay with it not being uh, properly framed up and then properly lit. And, and even when I think, uh, you know, kind of midway probably through when I was at Bay News 9 and we're talking about, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, uh, I think we were starting to just realize that. So we were having people go live on important kind of breaking news stories without it, you know, being properly set up and make sure the hair is right and stuff like that. Um, I think that there's uh, more of forgiveness for make, not needing that old style or kind of old format of everything just being perfectly in place. Um, so I think that's going to be uh, one of the evolutions. We're going to see more of that. Uh, I mean, TV news is in a weird spot that um, I saw just today that, you know, Fox News is coming out with their own standalone streaming service, Fox Nation. And it's like, I can't believe I'm only hearing about this now. This seems like something that they should have been jumping on as the number one uh, 24 hour. I will say every time I go into someone's house and they're older, they all have, they always have Fox news on. I don't know. Which which might be why they, they have it because. (laughs) Yes, because their their demographic clearly does not. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, I I think, I think there's, there's room right now um, with 
the fact that you're seeing the, the networks are not holding as much power and they continue to not hold as much power year after year. I mean, there's, there's still a lot there, but I think there, there's opportunity for uh, Viceland, uh, places that are doing that kind of uh, more alternative, kind of down and dirty journalism. Um, I think those are the ones that are gonna emerge and this is kind of a generation that's growing up on uh, Twitter, growing up on Instagram and stuff like that, that there's a code to be cracked uh, it's going to be tough, I think, for the CNNs, the, the Fox News, MSNBCs of the world uh, to really take what, you know, they've established, which has so much infrastructure and is so kind of rigid and, and kind of tangible uh, and kind of figure out how to win over that audience. Because at the end of the day, uh, there is a, a generation growing up that distrusts all news. Um, so if it's got a CNN label on it, yeah. if it's got Fox News, you've got people out there who don't believe in it. And I think what's going to happen is this is going to kind of part the seas a little bit for some of these kind of alternative, but really kind of couched in true journalism to kind of uh, emerge uh, and take over. Or, you know, the CNNs in the world are going to have to brand uh, differently so that it's not so front and center that this yeah. is CNN sort of, doing. Yeah, sort of like how they did a great big story and they tried to do that Casey mm -hmm. Neistat beam thing, which I guess didn't really work out. <laughs> uh, that's, that's interesting you say that. So do you watch a lot of YouTube yourself? Um, uh, not a ton. I, I'm, I'm, I've kind of turned into, which I never thought I would, more of uh, a phone purveyor of news uh, nice. Not purveyor, that's not the word I'm looking for, but I get most of my news from my phone now. Which, it's from those uh, Russian fake Facebook accounts. Right? I only follow Russian bots. <laughs> I believe everything they say and they have conflicting yeah. stories. So I'm like, well, this guy has a point yeah. that, you know, that the Russians did interfere. <laughs> well, this guy. Um, but no, I mean, like, uh, like most people, I think it's just so convenient. And I also commute to and from work on the train. So it's like, uh, I'm reading the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal on my phone on the way in. Uh, I haven't picked up a physical copy of the newspaper for, uh, I guess, here and there I will, but uh, everything that's in there is now right there in the palm of your hand. So uh, the scrollability, the searchability, um, I, I at one point was a little concerned about how much news was being filtered through influencers on social media. And there is kind of an echo chamber hive mind that can exist um, that is scary on social media when there's people that only get news stories that their like-minded friends you know are what, putting out there. You know who I find, what I find funny is that people are only consuming stuff that they agree with, which I think is oh, dangerous yeah. too. Like oh, if you're only reading dangerous. what you like, that's kind of disturbing also because you're not getting any other point of view and that's yeah. a little scary. Well, and it's funny because growing up in Florida, I have, a, you know, here in Chicago and kind of the, it's a very much more liberal uh, city, uh, you know, kind of the, the friend groups and stuff like that usually lean uh, kind of more that way. But from growing up in Florida, I still have a lot of really close, good friends that are very conservative, very kind of uh, right wing. And it's, it's actually kind of nice to see both sides of that coin yeah. because I think that, that's such a dangerous thing. And, you know, I, I talk to people about that here, um, especially, you know, people that are in the kind of uh, performing arts here and stuff like that, who everybody they talk to every day is very, very uh, liberal minded that I think it's easy for them to forget. That there's a big country out there. Yeah, there's people, there's a lot of people who don't agree with you. Absolutely. You have to learn to get along with them. Like and you can't they just. They were shocked by the yeah. election. I'm like, yeah. ah, have you driven through yeah. most of this country. I mean, like there, there are viewpoints out there that you, you neglect when all you do is look at your phone and it's the same. And, and yeah. And, and look at your friend's Facebook status updates where they all have similar views. Right. It's like, 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 you know, you should not like a lot. And of then they, and I find it funny that people will defriend others on Facebook for having different political views. It's like, Oh, I'd rather you know have. More yeah. Though. Like, I, I don't understand that because it's like, you know what? It's good to have people who will disagree with you and challenge you. Like if you only have friends that think the same way you do, you're going to be a really boring person for one. And you're never going to be able to argue your point because you never have to defend yourself. Yeah. Well, like, it's, it's that whole, uh, one, the thing that drives me the craziest and uh, regardless of what your opinions are, the whole, like, if you don't believe this, just unfriend me now yeah. and stuff like that. It's like, <laughs> Why are you so important that you're throwing down this gauntlet? Yeah. You know that most of your friends agree with exactly the stance you're taking. Like, you should want to be friends with people with different views. It's like the second you unfriend them, then you cut off 
uh, another viewpoint. Wrong, right, and different. Like uh, you, the more that you kind of bring into forming your own opinions, the better. Because there are a lot of times it's like I'll listen to people, I'll talk to people, I'll, I'll read what they're putting out there. Uh, that uh, at ultimately it ends up reinforcing uh, my opinion. That's uh, yeah. The, the the opposite of what they have but uh, at the same time there there's other kind of uh, stances that i'll take in my head and then i'll read some things and be like eh, i don't agree yeah. but there's there's some validity or some you know it's not all black and white it's not all bad it's not all wrong uh there's a lot of gray out there and if you kind of immerse yourself in black and white and don't go into the gray area then nothing ever gets done and the country keeps dividing further which yeah and no one's no one's listening to each other either or like really having an honest <laughs> conversation it's just yelling at each other and then like shutting everybody out oh yeah yeah uh, so that, that's dangerous too uh that whole thing so earlier you were kind of talking about like the cnn's and like the fox news of the world and i find it interesting that again you have these networks like that spending millions billions of dollars for programming and then you have these youtube channels that are like shoestring operations they get more viewership. What do you think of that whole, this whole state and media? Like, again, you've got the Philip DeFranco channels. There's a lot of channels, uh, the Young Turks, uh, mm -hmm. Ben Shapiro, Steven Crowder, a lot. Um, I'm trying to think of some other uh, channels. Joe, even the Joe Rogan podcast gets a lot of viewers. Yeah. You have all these people on YouTube who don't have nearly the overhead or the infrastructure or the budget and more people, more eyeballs, Casey Neistat, more eyeballs are on them than these like major mainstream networks. Like, I think that's very interesting. And again, that's kind of why I decided to go the direction I did. Um, but I think it's interesting to see this shift and also to kind of see the desperation among the traditional outlets <laughs> too. Um, because again, they're spending so much money on programming that no one's watching. Well, yeah, and then like we were talking about before, it's like they, they can't play in that space right now because they are so firmly established and entrenched in what their branding is and, and who they are, whereas, you know, uh, all the folks that you mentioned and these people are emerging on YouTube, I mean, it's, it's actually a beautiful time to be alive to gather in different opinions and be exposed to different stuff if you have the time of the day. I think that's why I don't watch a lot of uh, YouTube. I, I don't have a lot of time to, to jump into that, but I think we're, we're in a place where, like, people – with unique voices, people that are, um, you know, stating things in a way that's, you know, kind of uh, pertinent to what people want to hear. And um, there's just more of an audience now that it's not like even our grandparents and, and uh, our parents' generation were like, well, you have four TV channels. So whatever was on those four TV channels was what you get to watch. I mean, now it's like there's almost too much that I feel like there, there's this constant conversation that I feel like all of us are in uh, where it's like, wow, what should, what should I binge watch now? And then like you, you post that on Facebook, like what should I be watching? And 50 shows are listed underneath. And you're like, how, do, how are there this many shows? And then you end up going back to watch the show you've seen a million times. You're like, I'm just going to watch right. some office reruns. I want to yeah, watch Friends that's, again. That's the thing with, with YouTube is like, uh, like you said, like you don't need this. There's no, there's not a huge barrier to entry to get your viewpoint out there. And if you're creating good content and people come to it, then, then you're a good place. I think the, another one of the kind of uh, the things is the, I mean, there are those and then there's kind of the ones that have money coming behind them or they're, they're advertising it, they're boosting it, they're putting it out there. I mean, at the end of the day, everything's going to come back to once you figure out how to monetize something that's emerging then you got to find the next thing. So uh, it's always good and, and nice to see some of these either success stories of people that started with, you know, shoestring budget or, or doing things that way. And uh, they bring investors on. That's kind of the great American uh, kind of uh, story there. Uh, but I think it also, uh, you get into a place where you got to be discerning about where things are coming from and what the source is because it's like the boy bands of yeah. the 90s when well, you just kind of manufacture these things and on, the, on the flip side of youtube you have a lot of these people who are basically media outlets but they don't have that journalistic training again like the logan pauls so you have a lot of these people with a huge platform but they have no like i wouldn't say control but they just don't have any um filter or knowledge about like what they shouldn't put out there. So again, now you are getting people that are putting stuff out there. Uh, that's kind of getting them in trouble. Um, well, but I, I, yeah. I kind of, I like that. I, yeah. I like the fact that yeah, it's dangerous when it becomes 
uh, taking things at face value and it's about things that are uh, you know, going to impact people's safety or their financial stability and stuff like that. When it's somebody like a Logan Paul and it's like the, you know, it's like capitalism. It's like, he yeah. put that out there. I know you're at Logan. I know you're in the low gang for life, right? So, Is that a thing? The low yeah, gang? Yeah. So you're either, apparently you're either a Jake Pauler or you're in the low gang. Okay. Um, and, and they all have their, if you haven't seen any of the H3H3 H3 production videos, uh, that channel has put out some very um, humorous reactions, but both Jake and Logan make like a lot of money on merch. Um, Jake Paul even had a song, a Christmas song about buy. It was all about buying his merch. Like you, you need to watch this. It's like, all I want for Christmas is a Jake Paul shirt, you know, or whatever. And then the, but the funny thing is he was selling the song on iTunes as well. So not only was the song like just a commercial for the merch, but you, you could buy the song on iTunes for like 99 cents. What's um, his, well, where oh, is, he, I, I, I know of him, I'm aware of him. I haven't uh, wasted maybe there, I, of investing. I don't think you're him, in, but, in their target demographic of being a 14 year old no. girl. Um, but they're, they're interesting and obviously they're, they're, they're doing something right because uh, e even though you might not agree with them, uh, those, those guys are making a, a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Apparently they make millions on the merch alone. Um, so Logan Paul has Maverick merch, so it's, it looks like a bird okay. or something, you know, and, he's always wearing it. and they do something called dabbing, which apparently used to be cool among like the, you know, the yeah, rapper types, dabbing, dabbing yeah, but I think, but the once the Pauls got a hold of it, it was no longer cool in that community, so, yeah, like, no, I feel like dabbing, dabbing, I guess, I don't know, needs to be a new thing, uh, I don't know, I don't even know what that is, I'm obviously not in their, uh, you know, their circle, um, and I don't have any kids, so I have no, I'm like, what is dabbing? Like, I was looking yeah. that up. But, but yeah, some of these videos are kind of, are a little bit out there. Um, also, once you see the parents, you're like, okay, I totally get it now. Because uh, the parents look like super crazy. The parents are super crazy. Oh, and they're also from Ohio. So they're just- Oh, from, Florida and Ohio. They're, they're from Ohio. Crazy. Yeah, they're all from like Florida or Ohio, and they're from Ohio. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, if you're in the low gang, so you're either in like one camp or the other, and they all have their merch, you know. I like the low gang. I might the just low join, gang, yeah. If I joined the low gang, I feel like it would be so uncool and old that I might ruin the low gang. So I could <laughs> yeah. and people, people inside. I don't know, people might think you're like a pedophile or something, like because literally well the funny thing is <laughs> their their vlogs, which I find interesting, so their audience is like eight year old girls, but their content is definitely not appropriate for a like any I would say their content is not appropriate for anyone under the age of 13. Um, yeah. They swear they've got like sexual references. It's not like a real, I don't know if these parents just don't know what this is, um, but they're- not. They throw a tablet at the yeah. kid like just you know, Yeah, and the, I mean, since Jake Paul was on the Disney Channel, they probably think, you know, it's gonna be like oh, a okay. Disney Channel. Yeah, he got from, he, they were both like Viner, they were both big on Vine, and then Jake Paul leveraged his success to get a show some show on the Disney, I oh, forgot, was, Bizarre Park or something. Like, he was popular on the internet yeah. before he was on Disney. Yeah, so he was on Vine, and then when Vine closed okay. down, Vi they like YouTube convinced all the Viners to come to YouTube, um, and Jake and Logan Paul are some of the fastest growing YouTubers like in history. Um, oh, and also for like $57 or something, you can take Jake Paul's online class on social media called Edfluence. Oh, boy. Um, Edfluence, you, I'll send you the commercial after this, but the commercial alone, I feel like is screaming for a parody. Like, <laughs> it's like him getting out of like a Lamborghini or some, some crap like that. And he's talking about like how, you know, how he's a social media genius, you know, and all this stuff. I mean, he might stuff. be. He I mean, he, be. clearly I he's doing it, something but... we're not. Um, you know, <laughs> well, after I mean, this, after this episode airs, yeah, you're yeah, you need way to... past him in the, the views. I know. Uh, this, this interview, I'm sure will go viral and then we'll have our own merch line, you know, and <laughs> music video. Um, but yeah, I mean, these people are making, making more money than any, anyone in TV news combined, which is kind of sad. Um, <laughs> although the scary thing is the one making the most money is that Ryan Toys Review kid, the one who's like five or something. Um, he makes millions of dollars a year for opening toys. Um, oh, I've, yeah, I've seen and, heard and, of that. And the funny, when I think about him, I'm like, does he even know what money is? Like, he's like five. Like, 
He doesn't his even parents have do. His, his parents his definitely parents know what money is. He was you divorced know? them when he's seven. And <laughs> he's gonna emancipate and his own yeah. thing, you know. Yeah, once he gets his gets his own merch, and he has his apparently he has his own line of toys now. I, I just heard that. He has his own line of toys and he unboxed them at Toy Con this this week. Wow, that unboxing. I know. Isn't that crazy? Very strange to me. Also, there's so many channels where there there's unboxing channels where you only see the hands, you never see the person's face. And I also found a channel that scared me. It was a guy who just unboxes hatch he hatches hatchimals, but he appears to not have any kids and he's got like 50 hatchimals. Wow. So <laughs> Is the unbo the draw of the unboxing? It's just like the the kind of surprise of what's in. I is that I'm not really sure. Like I again, I'm probably not the one they're trying to go after. Being a thirty something yeah. person without kids, um, you know, I don't I don't know. Like, but uh, to unboxing stuff on camera is. The thing, also, there was those videos where people just eat on camera called, like, mukbang or something. I've definitely seen that, and, and that's like, weird, why? Too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. No, the unboxing, it didn't have a favorable uh, outcome for Brad Pitt in the movie <laughs> 7. Um, what did he, I've never seen it. What is he unboxing there? Is it? Oh, is it's it his wife's head. Okay. Uh, so, I just, I just, sorry, spoiler. That's like the, the, ult okay, that's like the ultimate like, unboxing. Right. Also, I feel like. Side note, I feel like Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt are going to get back together now. <laughs> now that she's getting divorced from Justin Theroux. Oh, is she? With, apparently so. I'm like, damn, she's going to get back with Brad now. They're going to reconnect or something. And yeah, it's going to be like the notebook. They're not going to get back yeah. together until they're too old and crusty. Like, the people aren't like, they're like, oh, that's kind of gross yeah. now. Well, and what was it? Brad and Angelina have like 18 kids or something, so I don't... Yeah, do they've got a whole like... Like, I don't even know how many oh, children yeah. they have, but like... I. I don't know. I'm glad I don't live in Hollywood. That's uh. I, I know about as much as their lives as I do the kid that unboxes. The kid things. that unboxes toys. I know. Uh, Ryan, you said. I just. Oh, you know, Ryan. Well, and here's the funny. Like I don't understand. So the channel is called Ryan Toys Review. But wouldn't it make more sense being called Ryan's Toy Reviews? I don't know. Ryan. But Ryan what? Toys Review. At least five. You got to give him credit. <laughs> the fact that he's even. <laughs> he's even able to type yeah, his own name. <laughs> is he really five? He's like really, he's, he's really young. Kid. They started the channel when he like didn't really, I don't even, like the first video I saw of him, his parents made like a big surprise egg. Like they made a paper mache egg that looked like the toys, like what was it, that Cars That's movie? And, and they put, and they put a bunch of crap in it and then had him open it. Okay. And I'm like, I, and that got, and the funny, and when you look at the channel, the earlier videos, like the production level was like cell phones. So again, for people thinking like, hey, I need to have like a professional setup, you really don't. <laughs> no, you just need a cute, I'm sure he's cute, right? He's gotta be. He is adorable. Kid. And I saw an interview with the parents. He didn't have an parents, ugly kid unboxing. No, but. and the parents look pretty like normal. They look very normal. I guess the dad was like an engineer or something and now they're managing his career full time, you know? That's, um, that's amazing. Well, he might be able, I mean, that's yeah. a very brilliant way if you're a kid of getting you're presents kid. constantly. <laughs> If you're like, eh. getting toy companies to send them. The family to business is now yeah. getting present. I'm opening toys. Oh, well, someone was pointing out, like, I wonder for him, like, will opening presents seem super lame for the rest of his life? Like, Christmas is work now. Birthday like, no one, like, nothing will be exciting to this kid. Like, I don't. No, he's going to come to hate boxes and presents and surprises equally and just be a bitter old man <laughs> at the age of like 12. I mean, yeah, I guess you wonder what's going to happen to these kids. I don't know. But yeah, there's them. There's the poplars. I don't, yeah, I don't even, I don't even know. Um, yeah, that's going to be tough to be a friend and go to his like bowling alley party and like, what should we get him? Well, I don't know. He's I don't know. a thousand toys already. So. What if they put him in a box or something? I don't, I mean, Ooh, be different. He, he pops out of the box like a cake. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but Ryan, if you're watching this, we're sorry, man. We're sorry. I'm not sorry, Ryan. You have more money than I'm ever gonna have. <laughs> yeah, that's. Shut funny. up, Ryan. And he. You get presents like, and get paid probably, to open. This kid what? probably has like no real concept of money, and he has more money than like anyone else. Yeah, how about you send some of that my way? I'll unbox yeah. it for yeah, you. Yeah, maybe you can help. Maybe you can volunteer to help Ryan with his. Uh, with his videos, you know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm probably would be very jealous. Or if they're looking for a PR uh, agency, maybe you guys could could represent him. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if Ryan needs my help. <laughs> Ryan sounds like he's doing pretty damn good, unfortunately. 
<laughs> well, I very much appreciate you taking the time to do this and showing me your awesome Chicago loft. Yeah. I want to give you the opportunity, Brian, to ask this audience any question you want. Okay. It can be any, any it can be about Ryan Lochte, it can be about toys, it can be about the Low Gang and whether you should join the fan club or. Oh, I kind of do want to know more about the Low Gang. The Low Gang. Actually, oh, you yeah. know what? What I want to do is, if I can use it for my own benefit, is what are what are the things that this is going to sound real creepy, but what are the things that young girls and young boys are watching on the internet that I've never heard of that if I had a child, say theoretically tomorrow, that was their age, that I should know so I don't sound like a super lame dad? Like what, what are those things that I just want to know about, but I don't want to immerse myself in at all? That's a good question. And, you know, like it's one of those things too, like you don't know about them, but like, ever, like if you were a dad, you'd probably be like sick to death of hearing about it. You know, like uh, <laughs> I, I was talking to our, our old coworker and Gina and her kids are obsessed with something called Daniel Tiger. I didn't even know what, what that oh, is. Oh, I know Daniel Tiger. Daniel Tiger. Okay. Apparently he's hot. You know, I don't, uh, shop, <laughs> I don't know if Shopkins are still popular. Those things that look like household yeah. items. Yes. You know, that company was making a killing on those things because they probably Absolutely. cost like two cents each. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure we would get cancer from them anyways, but you know. Probably, probably. I don't know. I'm probably going to get cancer anyhow because I, I just ate some generic SpaghettiOs, but I don't know. No, where. that's SpaghettiOs are one of the four or five food groups or something. It, it is, and I felt food. better. Apparently, Warren Buffett um, eats what? like he's a six-year-old child. So I was like, okay, I, I can relate to that, you know. Like he eats, like Bill Gates was talking about him somewhere and said, Warren, my friend Warren Buffett eats the – like he's a six-year-old boy. I was like, you know what? I get that, man. You know, I get that. Like ice cream and hot dogs. Yeah, ice that. cream, hot dogs, McDonald. Literally, it was like ice cream and hamburger. <laughs> and he's like, what, like 90 years old or something? So I guess it's yeah. working. Clearly, it's working for him. Hey, both him and Ryan are probably having the same <laughs> diet and have about the same amount of money, yeah. it sounds like. I don't yeah. know. It sounds like you, it sounds like you are going to be a Ryan fan, I think. Ryan. No, I think I'm a Ryan enemy. <laughs> right? Ryan? I'm I'm mad at that kid for making money doing the thing that we loved as children more than anything else. Just right. opening boxes of toys and making lots and lots of money. Like the views, the views on kids' videos are just bananas. So Brian, if you are going to start a YouTube channel, it needs to be about toys. Me, me opening toys. <laughs> in, very, your, in your loft, you know? Very creepy, very disturbing. You know what though? There are already a bunch of other grown men doing it anyways. And uh, apparently uh, it's okay. Apparently it's okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it's okay for whatever <laughs> followers are watching that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I want that uh, to be following me around on the internet. For I was thinking, so a channel that I would like to see, um, I have not seen any good channels doing this, but a lot of parents I talk to um, often get frustrated about putting together toys. I have not seen a channel dedicated to toy assembly, helping wow. parents put together toys. I'm sure um, they exist, but even more cathartic would be just videos of parents destroying the toys oh, that they couldn't quite get together. I like that. I or, like, and it would be funnier if they were all drunk. Like well, yeah. They, they the toys well drunk and see if they could do it. I think that would, that would be a channel, even though I have no, you know, reason to buy the toys. I would just watch that for fun. That's actually, I, if it hasn't yeah. been done, you should jump on that quickly. I, I totally get should. People to get drunk and put together like it's, IKEA tables yeah. and stuff, and then show like what it turns out to be. Yeah, like to just totally, you know, you, you just you're totally out of it, and you have to put together like a table or like a Barbie house or something. And I like drunk history, but it's way more oh. boring. Well, but you like speed it up, do like a time lapse thing. Yeah, I exactly. I actually did do a toy assembly video, and that was actually the most viewed video on the channel. <laughs> um, well, my husband, and I, I don't know if you saw this, but my husband and I bought a Disney princess carriage and drove it around for a video. How the heck did I miss that? But I'll have I'll, to look I'll send it again. to you. Um, we just bought it for the video. Like we had no other reason. I put it together and I was like, well, while I'm putting it together, I'll just kind of show it. And that got more views than like the funny, like the video we actually planned. So it was like, <laughs> and someone told me that the videos with the toys get a lot of views because it's kids watching them on a loop. Like if there's one thing kids will watch, they'll just watch it over and over and over. So that's my why all those nephew likes to yeah. watch roller coaster videos like that are taken over from over like and over, Pro, which are actually pretty awesome. It's better than I mean, at least he has like better college. taste, you know. Yeah. 
like if Ryan was riding roller coasters, I, I think I like it. would be cool with that, you know? And, uh, but so yeah, apparently, uh, have you ever seen those channels where it's like, a lot of them got taken down because they were kind of creepy, but it's like people dressed as Spider-Man or like Elsa from Frozen and they act out stuff at like a house or something. Those videos had like 200 million, view like one video on the channel <laughs> would have 200 million views and it was all from kids. Just, but some of them were like super, like some of them were like, they appeared to be, the whole controversy was that they appeared to be family friendly. But then when you actually watch them, you're like, wow, this is pretty not, not okay for kids. You know? Yeah. It just helps you identify who to keep away from your children. From your children, yeah. People, yeah. channels like that. Apparently not everything on YouTube kids is like very kosher. I don't know. But uh, we don't have kids, so we don't have to really worry about that right now. So. You yeah, know, it's a good place to be. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, right after I get out of this, I'm going to be joining the Low Gang. So no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Oh, I'll be a card carrying member by next. <laughs> <week. I'm laughs> you're gonna, gonna be buy, you're gonna be buying all that Maverick stuff and uh, growing and bleaching your hair and stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's what I needed at this point in my. You life. could start your own. <laughs> what if you start a competitor channel to um to them, but you're just like a thirty something year old dude. Like nobody wants to watch that. I think, you know, it would be funny though, if it was like an, a 90 year old doing that sort of stuff, like vlogging in that style, but it was like a suit, like a, like a super old guy. I think that would be awesome. I would watch I mean, that too. There, there's something there. There's something there's there. Some, I, be, sometimes I just think of channel on video ideas and I'm like, that would be cool if somebody did that. It'll be like me unboxing like practical items that I use around the house and then like chiding Ryan and being like, look, look, Ryan, I, I have a beard trimmer, Ryan. Oh, you can't grow a beard. <laughs> And then, like, can you please do that? That would be amazing. Your own boxing, like, step ladders or something, you know, like, just yeah, just like power tools or like a cell phone charger. I'm yeah. like, Ryan, yeah, I lost my other one. This is exciting for me. I don't need toys, Ryan. I'm a man. This is adult toys, these are adult, not fun toys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, other thing, the other thing I thought would be funny is to um camp out for Black, Black Friday at like a Walmart and vlog it. But then when you go in there, you buy something super lame, like you buy batteries or something. <laughs> like you waited for five days and then you go in there and everyone else is going towards the flat screens and you're running to the batteries or something. And that's buy, a, no, that's a great idea. See, you're like that would air, be air conditioner like, filters or something. You're like, like oh, I, I need, need coffee, it. man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, this has been a, a lot of fun. I do think, I feel like you should have a YouTube channel. I know you probably won't. Um, but when you do, if you ever did, you know I, me very well. yes. I think it would be amazing. So I feel like you should think of, please think about it because I think it would be, I'll start thinking about it and you could share it. musings on life. You could do your, uh, you know, adult unboxings, um, <laughs> maybe some random stuff, you know, I don't know. Um, also, you know, you could, is it really true? You tried to pay for a lady's groceries and she turned you down. Is that? Oh yeah, that was, that really was that Friday. Yeah, last week. I I thought I was doing a very chivalrous thing, and uh, I posted about it saying that I was trying to manufacture a real genuine moment so that I could <laughs> post it on the internet and virtue signal, and people would think I'm a great guy. But uh, no, it's odd. She she said no twice. The guy started ringing it up for me and said he's gonna pay for it, and she goes no. I will go get my wallet and left like all her stuff, and I I felt bad too because I, I don't know if she was sick or if this was just like a uh, cold. Friday, it, it was DiGiorno pizzas and Ben and Jerry's ice cream and like wow that's it, like that's like depression food right did so she was, go through a breakup or something or? I maybe yeah. so I, I don't know if maybe she thought I was being a creep when I really just wanted to create well, okay was she your age or was she like no uh, I think she was younger okay um, she probably okay so she probably <laughs> thought you were hitting on her but you weren't like maybe this yeah. it was absolutely not a a yeah. romantic yeah. uh th it was more like because she kept looking kept looking it was like this will be a I just want to get out of here first of all yeah, you're just trying to get her through the line through faster here. it's like sister come on I'm just trying to yeah, it was it, it was at least 30% me wanting to get out of there yeah. and 70% like this would be a nice thing to do to a fellow human yeah. and we've all been in that position but uh yeah, just denied thrice. Um Right. Pay. Wow. Yeah. Man. That's yeah. rough. You're offering to pay for girl like who does that? You're offering to pay for groceries and and she says no, man. No. I don't know. So, good on her. I mean, 
She didn't need my money. That's I know that. you're winning friends and influencing people everywhere. So this is one <laughs> example of that. You know, you've already changed Ryan Lochte's life. It's you and the Ryans now, you know? Yeah, maybe that's that's the reason that I don't like it over the world. Ryan. Yeah, it's because his name is Ryan. What's he put on his resume? Toy? Uh. Toy? Video, I don't know, probably like video star or something. I don't know. Yeah, web Richer, she, he just writes richer than you are. I don't know. Yeah, I hate Ryan. I'm going to look him up and just get angry. Yeah. At him. When you see his, um, there's a website called Social Blade and you can get stats on people's channels. And when you look at his, um, like you can see like channels rankings uh, based on like how many subscribers they have or how many views they get. And he's like in the top, he's one of the top. Um, definitely one of the top creators, especially in terms of views. I mean, he's uh, young too, yeah. so he'll he'll have his like drug addled breakdown and kind of you know crash a car or something by like eleven at this rate. I just want to know what our holiday is going to be like. Like Christmas is ruined for him forever. Like he just can't. The kid's no. never going to get excitement out of opening. He actually enjoys presents. wrapping presents yeah. probably at this point. Everything else is just going to the office and punching a card anytime. He's like, great. I don't know what it is. I guess I'll open it. Look, you know, it's this thing. He did have a really sweet cars, ra like race car bed though. So, I mean, at least he's living the life, you know? <laughs> oh, I'm sure he is. Yeah. He will be a spoiled little uh, shit by the time he's uh, eight years old. <laughs> Well, this has been a true pleasure. If is there anything else you would like to uh, to share with us before we before we no, head out? No, this was this was fun. I appreciate this is awesome. getting, and getting to talk about both Ryan and you know, the TV news business. <laughs> uh, you know, it's cool, it's cool what you're doing. I'm excited for you for where this is going to go. Well, thank you, and uh, for you for all of you watching, be sure to answer Brian's question. Are there any like kids things <laughs> that he needs to know about for his own? You know all the kid things, <laughs> yeah. You know whether it's like a fad or I don't know, like anything. I mean, I don't know the answer either. So it could be, you know, I don't know. There's always new TV shows coming out. There's always new movies. Um, oh, is it like Captain Underpants? I still don't know anything about that, but apparently a bunch of that's people. old school. That's been around for a while. Yeah. I know like, that. I'm like Captain Underpants, like the name of a movie. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I have no idea what any of this... I haven't been to the movies in, like, four or five years, so I don't know. If you did, I wouldn't recommend... Captain I wouldn't... That Captain wouldn't be the movie. Like and if I went there... <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't help my not-seeming-creepy thing either by, like, going to going to see a children's movie without kids, you know? Yeah. Like, when I went to go see The Hunger Games on, like, a Wednesday... You went to see The Hunger Games? Went, the very first Hunger Games, I think, it was right after I... Oh, was I still working at Bay News 9? I think I just... Uh, stopped working at Bay News 9 and had a lot of time on my hands and had read the book because my mom was like, you got to read the Hunger Games books, which this all sounds very strange, but went and saw it at like Wednesday at like uh, like 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. or something like that and was like the only person in the theater. So I was like, this is a weird uh, next chapter in my life and ended up going to the uh, a bar and seeing Brent, the bartender, a uh, friend of mine, and be like, that was an odd experience uh, that I'll never do again. How but many stars would you give that movie out of five? The Hunger Games? <laughs> Hunger. Um, out of five, I'll give it a solid three. Solid three, okay. Jennifer J. Law is a good, good actress. I've never seen any of them, so I don't even know. They're, I mean, it's popcorn films. Okay. Um, but they, they, they do a pretty good job with it. They're, they're very, I mean, the books, I think, were written because they wanted to, them to become movies. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, is that the thing now? People want to write books just to get, like, a movie deal now? Absolutely. Like, yeah. I mean, Michael Crichton was doing that, I think, pretty much the whole time he was writing books. But yeah, like, This is going to be a great movie with Michael Douglas in it. Or, you know. <laughs> exactly. Or, do you remember Congo? That was, like, a really weird one, too. I don't know if I've ever seen Congo, but yes, that was back when he with was the just gorillas. It was, movie it was all yeah. the scary ass gorillas. And do you remember like when the gorilla had, did you ever see it? The gorilla has this like glove on and she's like, good. Like the gorilla's name is Amy or something. Yes, Amy. I and the gorilla's like, good, good gorilla or something. And I'm like, what is, like, it was such a weird movie. Like, I don't, and it was scary too. Cause you're like, I don't want these gorillas coming after me. I don't. Because yeah, the girl was kind of like killing people or something. It was really kind of horrifying. I think so. I never saw that. But I did see War for the Planet of the Apes, the latest uh, Planet of the Apes movie. And to me, that should be the Oscar winner of 2018. And I'm not even kidding. Now, you were, back in the day, you were pretty um, not shy about seeing the movie Magic Mike. 
the, uh, no. the movie with, with Channing Tatum. What did you, did you enjoy that film? I think Magic Mike, the first one, I don't think I saw the second one, but the first one um, was a legitimately beautiful piece of dramatic <laughs> achievement. Um, I'm just kidding. Actually, that movie, no. I thought, even objectively, I thought it was uh, a terrible movie, but I thought it was funny to watch. Well, I remember it was a big deal because it was filmed in the Tampa area. Like, remember? Yeah. I remember my station doing a story about how it was like, they went to like a few of the locations and stuff. And <laughs> you know, I don't know. I've actually never seen the movie. So I don't, I don't know what I'm missing. But Not a very remarkable. Okay. You, you know what it reminded me of is, uh, remember Crossroads, the Britney Spears movie? I've never seen that one either. Am I uh, missing? Am I, is my life incomplete? Uh, it's, it's, it's a fun movie to watch. I went with like, 10 buddies the opening day came out wait you went to 10 guys to crossroads yeah i think it came out when i was was i a freshman or a sophomore in college and 10 of us went and saw crossroads and ruined the movie for all the legit <laughs> families that were there and it like sold out uh, and we had dads just yelling at us wait, what were you guys doing during the movie just laughing oh, at inappropriate places yelling inappropriate i mean it was you know, Ryan was, Lochte wasn't with you, was he? No, no, he, he wasn't with us. At the time. So but it's, uh, it's yeah. so over the top that it's, it's, it's humorous to watch. No, I have not, I have not seen that. And I, I, one, I do, I did forget to ask you this, but, um, a long time ago, you had done a blog post about how much you hated the TV show, The Newsroom on oh, HBO. Yes. Um, can you kind of elaborate on your thoughts about that show and like kind of what, <laughs> what you did how you didn't feel like it was very true to life yeah i guess at, i don't know i guess my memory's blinded with the rage that it caused um <laughs> i it just it's it it seemed like such a such a fant fantastical view of what goes on in a newsroom that it was like it wasn't even based in reality it was just like that could have been anywhere i don't know it was it was so over the top and i think the thing that really because i i kept watching because i think most of us who were in tv news were like oh cool a show that's it's a show about tv news. news it's like wait this right, is not the news watch this. That's, what, that's what we should do when we're not at tv news is watch tv shows about tv news especially uh, when it's the dude from dumb and dumber as the, the <laughs> i think he did an okay he did. job he was all right every other character on that show was nothing you'd ever encounter in a real newsroom and not only that they were all terrible like none of those characters were memorable none of them you kind of related to none of them uh had interesting story arcs i mean it was just beyond you know what? i yeah. think you need to do your own version but a more realistic <laughs> it can be set in gainesville florida Oh boy, we, yeah. we we actually I think we're up for. They were trying to find a TV station to do a reality show. Oh, that would have been awesome. Um, and we were one of the ones that they were thinking of. And of course, all of us at like twenty two, twenty. Yeah, like yeah, it'll be like the real world or something, you know. <laughs> and, and everybody who was like, no, this is not going to turn out the way you uh -huh. think. This will be very bad for all of your careers. Um, but I often think like if they would have done a reality show about um, WCJB in, in Gainesville and you know. Uh, what we were kind of doing at the time that would have been good tv but i mean you could be making ryan toys review money right now you have I mean, <laughs> what are you, you maybe you missed out on an opportunity of a lifetime yep if i ever find a time machine i'm gonna just go back go back say, you could be like the you could be like mike the mike situation of you know, <laughs> you know? of unboxing yeah unboxing. i don't yeah. want to go back and do anything else but be the first to start unboxing things and kind of own that exactly i i do like your idea of doing like really mundane and you act super excited about it like yeah. oh my gosh i'm opening <laughs> you know, it's it's a demon fire or something i don't know yeah, yeah. i don't know I and mean, clearly i've lost my mind but you know i don't know <laughs> whatever who who knows but yeah i i also did not I found the newsroom just to not be at all realistic about what I experienced. And I even worked at a network like that and it was right. nothing, it was absolutely nothing like, um, and I, I remember one of the things you'd said in the blog post was that real TV news people are more interesting than the people on the show. Oh yeah. And that I was, that was that one of the, problem. Yeah. yeah, like the, the real people, you know, in news are like way more interesting than any of those characters. Like they're funnier, they're smarter. Like they just, or you know more well spoken like it's just I don't know you just I haven't really seen a good TV show that encompasses all of that. Yeah, which is why I guess 
maybe that's the thing is if you tried to put out their characters that were similar to the people we worked with the news people like oh this is fake like there's no way that there's a, it's like oh the people in news are almost they're more entertaining than anything you could uh kind of write into a character exactly yeah we had a lot we had a lot of fun at that station and we got free cable so it wasn't all you know that was, that was yeah. a good perk for, that was a good perk for the tv news pay for sure yes. and we i think we got like free high speed internet didn't we get like half off a of pay-per-view too oh, like absolutely yep you know yeah i remember that <laughs> I remember arguing with my husband too over he wanted he always wanted to get those like the movies and I and I would be like I was really cheap and I remember talking to uh, remember our old coworker Dustin uh huh I remember talking to him, I was like yeah my husband wants to get this movie and I told him he's like it's two dollars I was like yeah right. I guess that's <laughs> I was like I guess that's a good point it is only two bucks so when yeah. you think about it like the the movie it's not that bad and it's a way cheaper than going to the theater like to see Crossroads so yeah you know. I know that was, that's probably one of your top 10 movies of all time. Maybe one of my top 10 mu movie experiences of all yes. time, uh, just because being there and, and ruining it for, you know, families that were taking their kids to see a Britney Spears movie uh, at the time, at the very least. And I know it's another one of these things that's going to come back around and bite me that I'm going to go to a movie with my family one day. And yeah, when you have, when you have kids and you're taking, them, when you're taking them to the Logan Paul movie and other <laughs> That will never happen. <laughs> I'll never take. If Brian ends up doing unboxing movies, then <laughs> then, then then we the one we're. About I mean, to. you seriously, you need to check out this kid. The, the amounts of views this kid gets is like insane. Like it's <laughs> it's just crazy. You're like this, and and like they get paid. It's not really based on your subscribers. It's based on how many people watch the videos, and this kid just is getting Rack. an insane amount of views from. Probably mostly children because I know it's not really coming from me. I think I saw like one of his, I saw like one or two of his videos for like five seconds each. That's about my experience with him. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know, but again, I, I'm not really into the Cars movie or, um, you know, Pixar stuff. So I guess, you know, I'm probably not in his fan demo. Yeah. I don't know. On it. Well, Brian, thank you very much. And uh, for you guys watching, if you are um, interested in being featured on this show and you're also an ex-TV newser, feel free to hit me up in the comments. And you could be where Brian is right now, you know. Not literally. You can't be not in my literally. I mean, you could not be. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, as like a, maybe, maybe if you're very special. We'll, we'll have to see. <laughs> um, but Brian, thank you so much. And I really appreciate you taking the time out to do that. And I'm so glad that you have found life after TV news. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. We'll see you guys next time.